Welcome to another edition of Pens Down, the program that brings journalists seven or otherwise to talk about their journalism journey, the issues that challenge them or the behind the scenes issues that they grappled with in their line of duty, which ordinarily we'll never get to hear. Today, uh, I have a gentleman, a gentleman with me. Uh, he was... He, he was once with a multimedia group, but currently into corporate communications. We'll be asking him why he joined the League of Journalists that are adding to the attrition in the field. His name is Kwabna Ousu Amprechum. My brother, you are welcome and a happy new year to you. Happy new year, Steve. How are you? Uh, very well, very well. A lot of trained journalists are leaving the field. You are one of them. What is going on? Why did you leave? I think it's twofold. Yes. One is a matter of natural progression. Okay. You know, the journalism profession is quite hot in Ghana. Mm. It comes with a lot of, the typical newsroom is a very hectic place. Mm. And as you grow, it becomes too hectic for you. Mm. To the point where the energy that you had when you were young in your early 20s and mid 20s, you don't have it anymore. Yeah. You have to let the other people, the ones coming up, continue with that level of energy so yes. that you take up different roles, which are, I mean, less, um, how do you call it, energetic, if I may say. Okay. You go or into the thinking, exactly, you go into the thinking part of the profession <laughs> instead of the physical activity part of the profession. Mm. Uh, that is one aspect of it. And another, another aspect is actually, I mean, to be frank, it's money. Mm. We all, in as much as we love what we do, mm. we need to a make ends meet and earn much more extra mm. to be able to live comfortably. Mm. And it happens so in Ghana that the corporate world often offers more mm. to journalists or people who go into communications and those who stay in media, that is journalism. Of course, mm. I'm not saying that it is an, not good there. A lot of people are making it there. And mm. if you really want to shine, you'll mm. be recognized and you'll be able to shine and be very successful. There have been very prolific um, journalists in Ghana who have been very successful remaining mm. in the media. Yeah. But another part is also to move into corporate communications, um, where I will say you go into onto the other side, mm. Now you answer the questions you don't ask them. <laughs> Just as you are doing today. Some, that also fetches some good money. And it also, I mean, you continue in journalism. You don't really leave journalism when you're into corporate communications. Mm. And it's even more challenging over there. Yeah. So, I mean, these are some of the factors that often pushes us. And it's also sometimes about looking for new opportunities. You know, when you stay at one place doing one thing, all the time. Sometimes mm. you just want to challenge yourself mm. and move into a different field and explore your um, your talent, explore your abilities in different fields mm. to fulfill, I mean, as, as part of self-fulfillment. Mm. So these are some of the reasons some of us have found ourselves out of the day-to-day um, -day media journalism profession, as you may call it. Wow. Um, but let's roll back uh, the tape. What was that single decision that made you embrace journalism from the beginning? I think I my my journey in journalism is very interesting mm. because my background is not journalism. Okay, it will interest you to know that in my first degree I studied agriculture at the University mm. of Ghana. Really? Yes. yes. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is why I've always said journalism is a passion. Okay, mm, mm. you you become passionate and then you learn mm. to improve on it. So with that one decision that made me enter journalism when I was young, I used to listen to GBC. I yes. used to listen to the news, and I would be imitating the newscasters, mm. um, listening to them. And I come from Mampo um, Ashanti. Okay, and I remember, I think after either junior high school, uh, junior secondary school, at the time it was secondary school. Yes. So 
so after senior secondary school, when mm-hmm. I finished um, pre sec, mm. I was waiting to enter the university yeah. and I went to Mampon to stay for a while. At that time, a new station had been opened, my TFM. Okay. And so while I was home one day, I just picked up my things and I went there and I told them that I can read the news. Just like that. <laughs> just like that. And they were new, so they were <laughs> looking for people. They, they gave me a script to read. Mm. And so I took the script and I read it and they were like, wow. So that is how it started. I started reading it. I So the news did editor you, did at you, that time. Did, what was their language, their broadcast language? Was it English it or was, it was mainly Chi, but then they had English bulletins. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it was an English bulletin that I did. Okay. And it sounded like the GBC that they've had. And so I was I was accepted. I mean, I, like I, I was imitating them all the time, just like that. <laughs> and so that is what ushered me into um, the media. Okay. That is journalism. So mm-hmm. right from there, I think at that time, the news editor was a GNA correspondent for the area. Okay. And so he realized my talent. And when I was mm. in university, he recommended me to the multimedia group. Mm. So I think in level 100, I did my attachment with Love FM. Meanwhile, I was pursuing agriculture in the university. But mm. during my long vacation, I came to Love FM in Kumasi. And Saeed also took me in, mentored mm. me. Saeed Ali Yakubo, blessed memory. Blessed memory. Yeah. He, he took me in mentored me and then gradually after school i did my national service in um, with the ministry of agriculture okay. so i was still in my agriculture i ditched journalism for a while but i think i did my service in obwasi once in a while i reported for multimedia when something occurred in obwasi okay. that is love fm mm. so after school i worked for about two years and then decided no journalism is my passion i love to hear people Mm-hmm. Um, tell their stories. I like to write the stories of others. And mm-hmm. I think, to be frank, I sounded good on radio and I could read and write very well with journalism. Mm-hmm. So I quit. I remember I was working with one of the telcos at that time. Mm-hmm. So I told Saeed in Kumasi, I want to come back to the media. Mm-hmm. And because of my track record with him, mm-hmm. um, he actually accepted me. Okay. And that, that was when I started practicing journalism, journalism full-time. This should be around 2010, thereabouts. Oh, I see. And so from there, I moved to multimedia. And I mean, that is how I moved myself into journalism. Okay, I, so I, for loved, you, I loved it. Mm-hmm. For you, with agriculture as a background, yes. uh, did you see journalism as a hobby or as a profession? I saw it as a profession, but I mean, to be frank, I did agriculture for my father. I always tell him that. <laughs> you know, those times, <laughs> everybody wants their son to do science. I remember exactly. when I was going to Presec, I had, actually, when I was going to Presec, I told my dad I want to do English. Okay. Oh, and he said, ah, English, when you study English, what, what are you going to get from English? People are doing science. No, no, go and do science. And so, I mean, they said I should go and become a doctor, but I don't like blood. So I told them I'm not going to be a doctor. Mm. I, so in Presec, you could change biology with agriculture. Okay. So you did your science, but then instead of studying biology, you did agriculture, but all the other science courses. And that is what mm. I did. So I did agriculture, went to the University of Ghana and did agriculture too. And so that... It, it wasn't that I'd always wanted to do agriculture, agriculture, because while I was in school, I was still doing journalism. I went to Joy FM, I went to Love FM for my attachments. Mm. And I remember my dad didn't like it. Oh. He had been told that journalists are killed, the profession is this, a lot of stories about journalism. Which are all negative. So, Yes, which are all negative. And mm. I think at some point I even had to defy him to do one of my attachments with um, multimedia in Kumasi when I was on long vacation because he didn't understand why I had to do it. But mm. it was a passion. And so I always tell myself I did journalism for myself. I did the agriculture for him. So after school, I gave him his certificate and then continued with my career. <laughs> you gave him his certificate. <laughs> 
<laughs> for him to do all the videos. <laughs> well, he wanted a, a science student, so I gave that to him. <laughs> wow. So you you decided to satisfy your father up to the university level by doing what you wanted for him. But then you exactly. never abandoned what you were convinced was your passion. Exactly. Yes. Mm. Now, uh, when this passion started paying you, how did it come to you then? Was it then beginning to look like the, pe- the passion doesn't pay or your expectation of the passion's ability to feed you and cater for what you needed was not being met? What was the, the experience for you? I really never felt that. Mm. I never felt that I wasn't being paid. I, of course, I, had, I, I would love to have been paid more, mm. but I always felt that I was doing what I loved and it paid me enough to sustain me. Mm. I don't think that there was any point when, I mean, I spent four years in Kumasi working for Love FM. Okay. And I, of course, you always want more pay, but I always felt that I could live sustainably on what I was earning. Okay. okay. You, you wouldn't be a millionaire being a journalist and you wouldn't be a millionaire working most of the time working for somebody. That's Millionaires right. usually make themselves. Mm. Okay. Mm. And so I don't, at that point, I, I, I loved it. I mean, mm. it was great telling people's stories. It was great seeing the change that came into the lives of people. So for me, even though I wasn't earning as much as I would, mm. that satisfaction came in to balance it out for me. Okay. Yes, that satisfaction came in to balance it out for me. So I really never felt shortchanged and I've never still, I've never felt shortchanged. I've never felt that I could have been better or earn more money entering another profession. Maybe yes, but would the passion be fulfilled? Mm. I'm sure when I see people telling stories, I would have told myself, this thing was my passion. I could have done it and I never did it. Mm. And I think journalism is not, is not something I will regret entering. And oh. I am still in it. I always call myself a journalist. It's, it's my first, and mm. <laughs> it's my first home and I always remain in it. Yes. Mm. You said from the beginning, you started, uh, even before you entered from the uh, radio station at Mampo, you were at Miming GBC, presenters as they read the news and all that. Yes. That, that uh, exercise of learning by doing, if I may put it that way, how yes. far did it take you when you entered mainstream journalism practice? How did it help you? Or was there a point you realized that, oh, this is inadequate. I need a lot more to remain relevant. Yes. Um Learning by doing took me very, very far Hmm. because right from when I came into um, Love FM, Hmm. even throughout the university when I was reporting for multimedia, Hmm. I was learning on the job. Okay. And when I took on the profession for the four years I was with Love FM in Kumasi, Hmm. I was learning on the job. Hmm. There were trainings here and there for us, but most of the time I was learning on the job. I was learning from my colleagues. I was learning from Said and Said Ali Yaku was very instrumental. Um, I've always called him the editor's editor. Mm. And so it was without any um, official training, mm. but I was doing courses here and there and also learning from, fortunately, multimedia had a big pool of very able and professional, and they still have mm. professional journalists that I could tap from. Mm. But at some point, there was a need to upgrade, no matter what you want to do. Mm. And I believe it is learning by doing that helped me to even get a very good scholarship. Mm. Being a journalist, one of the best schools is Cardiff University in the UK. That's right, in the UK, yeah. It was a school that I I had told myself I wanted to. And I applied a couple of times, but I couldn't get it. Mm. I I got the school, but I mean, I couldn't get a piece. Mm. It was was a lot. So I was looking for scholarship. Mm. Fortunately, I remember... In the same journalism profession, I was in the studio when I conducted an interview with um, the Talo Group. Okay. Um, they had the scholarship scheme. Mm. And so that was, they were, I think it was, a, they came to advertise it. So mm. I was the one who interviewed them on the morning show. So after mm. the program, I asked them, can journalists um, apply for this? Mm. And they said, yeah, we can, you, have, you can apply. So I applied. 
and I got selected, um, shortlisted. Went through a series of gruesome, I mean, gruesome and tough interviews and Whoa. aptitude tests and others. And thank God, uh, by merit, I was able mm. to get this. And so, from what I have learned, mm. even though I came with an agric certificate to apply for a journalism school, mm. because of what I had learned and what I was doing, mm. they were they they admitted me. And I remember when I went for the interview, um, one of the panelists asked me. Um, you did a Greek. Mm-hmm. So what moved you? Mm-hmm. Well, I told them, well, my passion moved me and my work tells it because I had a lot of documentaries and publications yeah. that they could compare to. Mm-hmm. And, and I, my Greek results, because I was not into our Greek, wasn't really that good. Mm. I, I hate mathematics. <laughs> 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 and so I think in the university, the cutoff point was, mm. for the scholarship was um, second class upper. Okay. But then I got second class lower in a grade. Okay. And so when I went, they asked me, uh, the cutoff point for our scholarship is second class upper. So how come you are here? So first of all, I told them, I sent you my certificate. You shortlisted me right from the beginning of this so, so I'm sure you saw something in me that I told them you look at you look at my transcript the only thing that brought me down was mathematics all my mm. other ones crop science and others I had A's and B's so okay. it is the math that is the problem and as a mm. journalist I'm not going to calculate anything anywhere mm. and so you give me the thing <laughs> well, I mean with the work I have done Mm. They, they saw it and then they gave it to me. And so this is, and I was able to get a scholarship to Cardiff University mm. where I'd always hoped to be. And mm. it changed everything for me because now on top of the passion and learning from the big people, I was getting the quality education that I needed to yeah. push my career. And so, yes, right. it's been very helpful learning mm. by doing. It's been very great. Mm. Yeah. Let's look at your time as a journalist. Now, one of the principles is that journalists are participants, are observers, not participants in the news gathering, processing and reporting enterprise. Is there any report or documentary you did that got you so emotional such that you yourself at the end of the day realized this one, I was so much into it? Is there any particular... Oh, yeah. Yes, there were a lot, but one particular issue that I really got involved in was the um, Fulani um, issue at Agogo in the Ashanti region. And this was more like a project, one Mm. of the biggest journalism projects that I I did. Mm. And I could spend hours and days in Mm. Agogo, Mm. speaking to the Fulani men, speaking to the people of Agogo. And at the end of the day, I realized I was inside the, the story That's right. to the extent that even when the Ashanti Regional Police com- uh, Security Apparatus were conducting covert operations, they mm. called me because they knew they could rely on me to deliver. I mm. could speak to the Fulani Hersmen and I could speak to the people, mm. the, the people who were affected. Okay. And... I realized at the end of the day, I had become part of it because every side looked at me, looked to me to tell their story mm. without bias. Mm. And I saw the uh, suffering of the people, mm. how their farms were being destroyed, how mm. their livelihoods were practically being taken away from them. Mm. But then on the other side, I also heard from the Fulani men, mm. how they were blamed for the things some of them believe they didn't do. Mm. And the fact that the story was far bigger than what came out there. Those mm. cattle don't belong to the Fulani herdsmen. Mm. They belong to big politicians. So how do they, how do they even fight them? <laughs> so, yeah. mm. Fulani herdsmen mostly don't own their cattle. They only so they, get in they the were cattle. just fronts for the big people. Exactly. Mm. Because they are having AK-47s. They are having mach- uh, machine guns. Where did they acquire them from? You mean a Fulani headsman in the bush with cattle yes. has those sophisticated yes. weapons? For what example? They have those arms. They have those arms, fully armed. 
who gave it to them. They'll tell you the people who gave it to them. They'll tell you this castle belongs to so so and so. This castle belongs to so so and so. And so it became a very complex issue. Mm. And at the end of the day, there was an amicable resolution. Mm. I mean, and I think things are not as they used to be. Mm. And by the time I left um, Kumasi to go to school, at that time, the police have been able to resolve most of mm. the issues that they had. And so that was one very involving story run for many years. Mm. And I think even looking back up till now, I still engage with some of the people, some of the farmers, because we became family. Mm. Um, and that, that is one story. I look back and I'm very happy that I was able to help mm. and resolve how, um, the, the impasse over there. Yeah. How did you deal with the issue of your own safety in the midst of all these complexities where names of quote-unquote untouchables in the society were mentioned freely by people who dealt with them directly? And for you as the intermediary and the voice, you needed to put something out. How did you deal with your safety? Were you at any point threatened? Was your life never in danger? No, I really never felt threatened. Mm. Um, if, if there was any danger, probably I was naive to it because okay. a lot of the times I went with the police. Mm. I remember one um, one issue where a Fulani Hairsman was actually murdered mm. um, deep in the bushes at um, the Afram Plains. Okay. And so myself and the police, we were supposed to go there. The Fulani people actually told me, called me that their people have been murdered. Mm. And so the police will be going there. They want me to go with them. Mm. Most of the time we told the stories of the people of Agogo. And of course, mm. they were suffering the brunt of it. The Fulani people with their cattle had no business being there. Yeah. But then I remember the Fulani people picked me. We drove to one of the villages and mm. the Fulani people picked me with a motorbike. Okay. This was around 10 in the morning. Okay. And my driver, um, the driver was waiting in the village for us. It was some mm. distance that you couldn't travel with a car. Mm. So when we went, we came, it was around 4, 4 p.m. and we were not back. Mm. And the people of the village came to surround our car, mm. saying that the driver made me go with the Fulani Hesman. They've gone to kill me. Because... Oh. Yes, because they haven't seen anybody going with the Fulani Hesman. To them, they were dangerous. Mm. And some of them were. So when I came back, the adults surrounded the car. I came back with a Fulani guy who took me there and told them that, no, they didn't go and murder me. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> we went to also see the part of the, of the, of the story. Mm. But in all those reportings, we, <clears throat> we stayed away from talking about the owners of the cattle. Okay. Okay. It was the Fulani Hairsmen who were responsible for the cattle at that time. Okay. And yeah. so they, we had to deal with them directly. Mm. And so they are the people we talk to. Okay. And if we talk to them, they go and talk to their bosses. Mm. And so we never really, one of the few people that I dealt with directly was um, a large grocer. Okay. He had, some cattle over there. I remember going mm. to him and he was very furious that I had come to ask him about the cattle and all that. It was a very <laughs> interesting interview. We didn't... <laughs> I remember Said secured me that interview. He was insulting me here and there. Mm. I, I, I might the people want to speak to the people, but at the end, we had a very good interview. Mm. I mm. think he misunderstood me from the beginning. He thought mm. that I was telling one side of the story. So, yeah, mm. I really never felt threatened because the police always, I always made sure that the security council knew I was going in at that time. Mm. And a lot of the operations, I had, um, I had police protection. Mm. And at the time that I also went with the Fulani Hesman, because they knew I was telling a balanced story, mm. they, they also offered me protection. Mm. Yeah. You, you worked uh, primarily in the Ashanti region. And yeah. uh, that is one place where tradition is very much upheld in everything you do. 
Uh, there are times even for what, whatever you want to do, you need to go greet the chief or let the elders know you have come. There are certain things you cannot just open your mouth and talk about it uh, without proper permission. And, you know, all these traditional injunctions and hurdles, how did they affect or impact on your work as a general? For instance, when news, the commercialization of news meant that breaking news should be treated as such. For instance, I have the story hot and exclusive. It is breaking, but I need to clear with so so and so and so should, so I don't get hold before a certain commission or committee or some traditional grouping. How in the mix of all this is how did you navigate? I think one thing that multimedia does very well is mm. independence, give independence, mm. make our journalists independent. Mm. And there wasn't so much of um, censorship. Okay. Once you had the news, once mm. it was authentic, once you could back it with the facts, mm. you could report it. Mm. Of course, there were some sensitive issues that you had to clear, mm. and some of them, in the name or in the I mean, in the interest of peace, okay, and stability of the society, you just don't go out there because it is breaking news. You just don't go out there and say it mm. because it is breaking news. You live in mm. the society, and so the safety and the sustenance of society is paramount. Mm. I mean, even our BBCs and our CNNs, there is a point where they will not go. Mm. There's a point where the BBC will never destroy the monarchy. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yes. And so in as much as we had the independence, mm. we we're very circumspect of what we reported ourselves. Mm. If it had to go, it had to go. I remember there was very one incident where it was reported that the Asantini had lost gold abroad. Yes, I remember I mean, that very yes. well. Yeah. And people were talking here and there. And I remember going to Mishia and being called by multimedia to speak to it. And I told, I told them on air clearly, I mean, you cannot say these things about the Asantini because he's revered. Yeah. Um, and no one in Ashanti will dare say that. Mm. Mm. He's done this or he's done that. Yes. Because... He's somebody everybody loves and respects. In fact, the, the, the description was that his crown jewels were exactly. missing. Yes. In as much as it was false at that time, mm. this is something you cannot just say people are saying it, so you're also going to report it. Mm. Mensha is often quite tight they on giving you information. They will not talk to you. Yeah. But you also have to know where the limits are of your mm. reporting goals. Mm. Everything has a limit mm. in as much as we want to practice fair, free journalism. Yeah. In the interest of state, in the interest of society, there are some stories that you need to treat very carefully. Mm. Mm. And we learned that the hard, I wouldn't say the hard way, because I never really found myself in trouble with Chipton C or with anyone. The only person I think I had... Um, <laughs> trouble with was one <laughs> politician. So we are more phone call. <laughs> oh yes, yes. <laughs> there, was an, there was an issue with his driver, and I reported on the issue before I came to the station. He had come there and said, "Where is that impression?" I, I, he was ready to beat me. I wasn't there, but I don't think he was. <laughs> I'm sure he's the only one, one of the few people I had direct confrontations with. Mm, mm. But those restrictions, a lot of the pertinent issues that happen in society that has to cause change yeah. that has to be that has to change for people mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to 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 live good better lives they don't bother on these chieftains issues okay. and so those are the things i focus on the social issues the economic issues the environmental issues that changed people's lives mm -hmm. those were my interests as yeah. for the censorships we dealt with them in the best of ways that we could the Ashanti region uh, is partisan on two fronts, politically yeah. and in terms of soccer or football. Yeah. Uh, there is the predominance of Asante Kotoko within the region, being, uh, yeah. and the region is its homestead. There is also a preponderance of NPP support base within the Ashanti region. When, yeah. when push came to shove and you had to... Uh, raise yourself or face 
uh, the reality by maybe taking it all out on any of their darling entities? How was the decision made? How did you confront that reality? I think it's, I've always operated on fairness and, object, and objectivity. Mm. And I have never stayed away from commenting on issues that I felt strongly about. Mm. And so my NDC friends will tell you I'm MPP. My <laughs> MPP friends will tell you that I am NDC. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a, a cousin, um, Bobiansa. He's a cousin. He's a he, he's a NDC aligned. He will tell you, you this MPP man. <laughs> we know where you are coming from. And I have this um friend of mine. Um, he used to do sports, and he always tell you, we know you are NDC. Wow. So when I got to the point where I had these sites saying I was here, I realized that I probably am doing something right mm. because. Sometimes some things are just, I mean, commonsensical, mm-hmm. and you cannot. And being a journalist, a journalist does not mean that you have to be fair. Okay. If you go, if you go and meet somebody killing someone, and you say that you are fair, you won't intervene. Mm. You are actually on the side of the killer. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to be objective, but you mm. you cannot be fair all the time. Mm. Being fair is giving people equal opportunities. Mm. But where somebody is maligned, you don't say that you are being fair, so you are going to remain aloof. You will mm. not talk about anything. Mm. For, for, for politics, <clears throat> I said my mind. Mm. If it's NDC, if it's NPP, whoever it goes against, and even up till today, sometimes mm. I do it to some, to some point. As, yeah. for soccer, as for soccer, I wasn't afraid to show my face. I am not for Kotoko. <laughs> And for my colleagues in the office, I always had a fight with them. I am a phobia. Mm, mm. I, I root for phobia, mm. even though I don't follow I mean, stalker so much because of the 2010 heartbreak in South Africa. Mm. But since then, I, I doubled back on the... <laughs> on... <laughs> I mean, I, I doubled down on my on my love for on my love for sports, but mm. I I don't support Kotoko and the and my colleagues and friends. They know that mm. for that it's play, so we we will get, we always get away with it. Mm. Was there any assignment, that singular assignment that virtually changed your perception and? almost dried up your interest in journalism. Let me give you a scenario of what somebody told me, not connected to journalism. Though. A colleague once told me that he bought his first car two days after he was drenched by some heavy rain, which tore his two shoes in the heart of Accra. And in fact, after that experience, he told him that wherever I need to find my money, I have to buy a car. You know, was was there that defining assignment for you, which after you took it on, you realized that no, I need to rethink my presence in journalism or my decision to pursue journalism as a profession? Um, I wouldn't say it's one event, mm. but it had to do with politics. Okay because most especially when I moved to Accra. Okay. And in the heat of the 20, the run up to the 2016 um, elections. Mm -hmm. I felt that I was doing a disservice to Ghana at some point because you would have politicians come on air Mm. and tell lies. Yes. Mm. We all knew they were lies. But you as a journalist can't go and tell the people they were lies. Mm. And so I hated political reporting. Mm. I hated doing interviews with politicians because, Mm. and I think it was at that point that I decided for how long am I going to be a vessel for MPP and DC to be saying what they want? Mm. Because (laughs) political season, you need to report. They will do a press conference, they will rush there. You knew what they were saying was just political propaganda. That's right. You had to report it. The next moment, one the, right after one news conference, the other person is doing a news conference to counter it. You mm. realize they were playing. 
Yes, that's true. It was play. Mm. For them, it was business to get power mm. for themselves, mm. for their families. Mm. Very, very little to do with the electorate. That's true. And sometimes you see how they will be fighting on there. Once the mic goes off, they are thinking of where to go and eat or move to. Meanwhile, the supporters out there are fighting and injuring themselves. Yes, yes. It was one defining moment that mm. to rethink my mm. involvement. It was mm. Sometimes it was difficult knowing very well you are interviewing somebody, you had the facts and all that, and the person is just lying. And you mm. can analyze it. Yes. It would take my, you, you cannot tell him. Come on, you're lying. Mm. Yeah. Mm. They knew they were propagating an agenda for themselves. It was pure propaganda, but yes, really, you reported it as they said it. Yes, for the people to make their decisions. But yes, I'd rather not report that. Mm. We had to do it. So I think that was one of the things that made me rethink my interest in journalism. And so because of that, I mostly moved on, moved into socioeconomic issues. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I, I wasn't really happy with politics. It's easier to do policy because the politicians are ready to speak all the time. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, it wasn't something I liked. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Looking back for the for the number of years that you were actively involved in journalism. If you have to turn back the hands of time, would you take back those years and give it to another profession or they will still be dedicated to journalism and even more? They will still be dedicated to journalism. Mm. And even today, mm. I'm into corporate communication, strategizing and all that. Mm. But the bedrock, the fundamentals of it, the fundamentals of it mm. is journalism. That's right. And so no, I don't think that I would change into a different profession. Mm. Mm. I would still do the same thing. Mm. Maybe um, my my if I was not a journalist, I would probably be um, a political scientist or something. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that, that would work for that one. <laughs> mm. Wow. Wow. I mean, around those lines, but mm. it's. It's been a very good journey, a very mm. beautiful journey, one that's mm. fulfilled my passion mm. and one that has gotten me places where I wanted to be. Mm. Because the things that I set out for myself, the schools that I wanted to go to and all mm. that, and I believe journalism has taken me the places where I wanted to be. Mm. And I wouldn't regret any day mm. going, um, going into journalism. If I had to do it again, I will do it again. Wow. And do much more than I did. Mm. Mm. Uh, with corporate communications, one of the key things you'll be doing is media relations, interfacing with journalists from time to time, sometimes having to state the position of your entity with such force, passion, and confidence to ensure that it sinks down for them to capture it in the exact ways you want. How has the experience been? You now being the news maker, quote unquote, and others reporting you. How has the experience been since you you went in there? I I remember um, one of my bosses told me I still have mm. the mind of a journalist <laughs> because whenever we have issues to articulate, mm. what I always tell them is. I was on the other side. Mm -hmm. I am now going to tell the story for the other side. When I was there, what did I expect to hear? Mm -hmm. okay. So typically, for instance, if you send me, when I was in the media, mm -hmm. if you send me a press release, a very lengthy press release mm -hmm. that talked about what you've done a lot, I'll say this is rubbish. <laughs> Situated in a story for me. Exactly. Yes, situated in a story. Okay, so as a corporate organization, let's say you've gone to do a donation, you've gone to build this school, you've gone to mm. build this, uh, the, yes, you've built a school, so what? Okay, so that's what I asked myself when I was there. When you come and tell me, you'll come and cover a program, we are commissioning a school. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, you are commissioning a school, but the government builds schools, many other people build schools. Yes. What will the school's impact be? That is where mm-hmm. I want my story to be from. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we built a school here. Either to what was the situation? What mm-hmm. is the situation? What, what how is the situation going to change mm-hmm. once we build the school? And mm-hmm. so that is where when I came into corporate organizations, I came, I, I moved for I am um, that is how I presented my story to my journalists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And one thing is I've always made them feel like I'm a part of them, which I still am. Mm. And so when I have things to articulate, sometimes I call them, this is what I want to do. Mm. And so I even need your help to do it because Mm. we are brothers. Mm. So then I make sure I send them the story the way I wanted to have it when I was a journalist. Okay. That that is my working principle. Mm send them the story in such a way that sometimes I send press releases and they don't edit Mm. because I practically write the story for them in a way that I would have loved when I was a gen. I was practicing as a gen. Mm. And I think that is how I have gone about um, with my corporate organization, especially when I have to deal with the media. Mm. And so far, it has worked for me. Mm. Things have to be articulated. It won't be always smooth. There are times when I had to push things. You, you, you push against me, I push against you. <laughs> it's been very cordial because of my background mm. in, in, in the media. Mm. And I think I have enjoyed it. I have really mm. enjoyed it. Even in corporate communications, I enjoy it because it's the application of what I have learned as a journalist and what I have also learned on how corporate corporations communicate. Public communication is always about speaking to um, journalists or articles. That's right. That's right. Internal communication is also very key. Sure. To getting messages within the organizations of people, mm. strategizing on how to make your um, colleagues understand mm. management's position and all that. And so mm. those are even more difficult than speaking to the media. <laughs> the experience I gained in the media has helped a lot. Mm. I always go out there, ask as many questions as possible as a journalist, mm-hmm. and then as a strategist, answer them before I meet the journalists mm-hmm. or meet the people that I, I, I have to convey information to. Mm-hmm. And it's been, it's been very good for me, yeah. Have you come under fire from the media since you entered corporate communications? Maybe your company made the headlines for all the bad reasons. And you had to do damage control, and they realized you were being shady with the commentary, or you were being you were being dodgy or, or evasive with the questions. So they decided to open fire uh, on you fully. Have you ever come under fire in such a manner? You can call it friendly fire if you want. <laughs> I have. I think um, the, I think there was one particular incident where mm. I mean. I didn't like the reports that came to that came from my journalist friends. Mm. But then when I was in journalism, I was not influenced by what a corporation will say. Okay. I was influenced by the facts on the ground. Mm. Okay. And so I have dealt with giving facts. Mm. I mean, if you ask me a question and I don't have an answer for you, mm. I'm not going to beat around the bush. Mm. And like I told you, when there is an issue. Mm. I put myself in the shoes of the journalist and ask mm. as many questions as possible. Well. Yeah. And those that I have to answer, I answer them. You can't mm. always answer every question satisfactorily. That's right. And so there's so much you can do, but you always make sure that you do the best of damage control to protect the reputation mm. of your corporation. Mm. And so, yes, there's been a time when I had called a journalist or a journalist has called and some of the things they ask, I have not been dodgy. For me, being dodgy is not part of my of my um, mm. of my style because okay. the more dodgy you are, the more you make room for speculation. Yeah. yeah. So make sure that the facts that you can release, release them. And the things that you think people want to know, mm. give it to them mm. in a way that will not hurt the reputation of the company. Of course, it has to be agreed. I'm not the only one. It's mm. a whole panel of communication specialists that decide on the strategy to yeah. on mm. when you are doing something. Mm. And so we've been very effective 
mm. in our information that is important. Mm. And those that we believe cannot go well. Every journalist understands because even in the media organizations themselves, mm. there are issues within them that cannot come out. Mm. So every journalist know that knows there's a limit to what mm. they give. So yes, I have come under fire for, from some of them for not giving them what they want. Mm. But I've always had a way of articulating my point to make sure that you carry what I want you to carry because mm. that's my job. Mm. I see. <laughs> Uh, maybe my last question. During your time in radio with Love FM, you did some live reports from assignment locations. Was there any time that after a live report, you realized that, no, I did not give out the full picture or rather the issues I put out there? Uh, it looked like I, my mind was wondering so i couldn't really tell the story as it should have been told a colleague once told me something that he had gone on assignment shortly after the assignment ended he was called and told of the death of his mother now almost while he was on the call his news editor was also calling he was a radio reporter so immediately after the call, he picked and told him, hold on, you are going live on the 12 o'clock news. So this person gets mixed up with this bad news and assignment. And then he doesn't even remember what he said on radio. He gets to the, uh, the, the office and then his news editor is completely mad at him. Did you, have your, did you get into such a scenario? We are not talking about death or anything like that but such that something unconnected to your work, which happened within the time you were supposed to process and release the story, affected your reporting so much? I wouldn't recall any incident like that where mm. an external factor mm. resulted in me not being able to report. But there have been instances where I wish I could put a different version or a different angle than I reported. Mm. Mm. And sometimes it is affected by the time limit mm. because when you have live reports, there, there's limited time. And sometimes the information you had at that particular time. I remember mm. one incident where I think it was around Kenya, so there was a Galante, um place where I think one of the generators exploded and killed someone. Mm. And when I got there, they told me just when I got there, it was 12 o'clock and I had to report on the news. Oh, wow. And they gave me false information. They told me, oh, nothing happened. Um, we are all fine here. That was just when I got there, the first people that I met. Mm. But then about five, 10 minutes into after the report, when I mm. went on to see how things were, I realized that one person had died. Oh. And so at that point, I realized I had given false information. Mm. based on what I had at that particular time. Mm. And then, I mean, of course, sometimes you have the chance to rectify it in subsequent mm. reports. Mm. So, and I remember one very gory incident too mm. in, I think, um, around Agogo. There was an accident where over 20 people died. I had to go mm. to court. Mm. And the scene was not something I liked. Mm. When I went there, they are taking all the people to it. The accident actually happened opposite the morgue. I think it was okay. in mm. So they are taking the people to the morgue, and we were entering the morgue. Just as we were entering, I had a call from the studio mm. to give a live report. And so I told them what happened. I gave the report. It was quite emotional because mm. I mean, the scenes and the accident yeah. and all that had mm. already become emotional. Mm. Um, with my reporting. Yeah. So I was very brief when mm. I told them what was happening and I was supposed to go into the mob to see what, has, what had happened in the people. Just after the report, my, the driver and some other journalists who had entered mm. were coming out. So I was mm. entering, and when I looked at their faces and their descriptions, I told them if I have to report this and it would be the, I mean, if I have to go in there mm -hmm. to sustain my job, I am not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> because they were, coming, they were 
looking silent and crestfallen. You had you had body parts, so they had, hmm. had to keep body parts. They didn't know who it belonged to. So I'm not going to look at this. Wow. And for I would not give a detailed report of that of that accident. Mm. Later, there were pictures on social media and all that. Exactly, I remember. From, from the mortuary. And I think it was one incident that I didn't go as far as I should have gone. Mm. About that report. But I don't regret it because mm. it wasn't, at the end of the day, we got the basics of the story. Uh, there was an accident mm. and these were the number of people who had passed. But I wish mm. I could have gone to see and report on all those things, but gladly I could not. Mm. Wow. Well, wow. Is there that one person you had really wished to interview, but you never got the opportunity to? Yes. Um, I think that one person that I really wanted to interview was um, Kamala Dumo. Mm. Of blessed memory. Yes, of blessed memory, because mm. he was my role model. Mm. Um, I remember a very young um, Kwabna and Brechu mentoring Joy FM and <laughs> seeing him perform, and he was so cool. Mm. Uh, he going to the BBC. I think mm. I remember when I went to the BBC sometime when he was, I saw him reading the news from a fire and all that. And mm. I was hoping that one day I could have an interview with him to share. Mm. with Ghanaians, his journey. Yeah. How he made it over there. And mm. I've always looked at, I mean, him being old, mm. and sharing his life story with Ghanaians. And unfortunately, um, it could not happen. So yes, I would not be able to ever do that. Wow. It's mm. unfortunate. But yes, he was the one person I would love to talk to. Mm. Thank you very much, my brother, uh, for this uh, opportunity to go back with you into your journalism journey. I know definitely this has triggered some memories that probably you hadn't had time to sit and, you know, play them back, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> as you said, you are in corporate communication, so you still consider yourself as doing journalism. Uh, we only are hoping that materials like yourself will not continue to believe in the profession that's one thing we hear because it looks like the attrition rate is so high <laughs> but you dealt with that issue from the beginning talking about especially on the issue of remuneration i think is one of the critical things uh, that seem to favor the decision to move on for so many people thanks a lot for this opportunity it's been passed down with kwabna uzwan prechun he, I don't know whether to call him, he, he say he was a journalist and he's now into corporate community. Yeah, he yeah. might end up taking me to court for reducing his rank. <laughs> but he... Oh, I'm always a journalist. Exactly. He was reported for the multimedia group, but currently he's into corporate communications, organizing image and reputation around uh, corporate entities. Thanks a lot, my brother, for the time. This has been Pence Down. We'll be back next time with another edition of My Journalism Channel. Stay tuned.